Following the nationalization of the Suez Canal by Gamal Abdul Nasser on the 29th of October 1956, Israel armed forces invaded Egypt. Days later, the French and the British joined in on the invasion, leading to a crisis that came to be known as the Tripartite Aggression or the Suez Canal Crisis. No other event in world affairs at the time involved so many nations and a threat of a nuclear war like the Suez Canal Crisis. It pitted the old powers against the new and the developing world against the West. It nearly brought the Soviet Union into the conflict and damaged British relations with the United States, leaving the world on a blink of a third world war. The crisis served as a testing ground for non-alignment movement for the Security Council and the concept of UN peacekeeping. It introduced the Cold War into Africa and hastened the decolonization of the continent. This is an African perspective on the Suez Canal Crisis of 1956. Connecting the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, building the Suez Canal was one of the most deadly projects in modern human history. The canal was manually dug by over 1.5 million workers, most of whom were forced labor in a period of 11 years. The task to build the canal was under a former French consul to Cairo, what? Ferdinand de Lesseps, financed by both the French and the Egyptian governments. It is estimated that at least 120,000 people died from heat, thirst, and disease caused by unsanitary conditions while digging the canal. In 1856, the Suez Canal Company was formed and granted the right to operate the canal for 99 years after the completion of the work. The canal grew into one of the world's most heavily traveled and strategic shipping lanes. It provided the shortest link between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean, easing commerce for trading nations and helping the European colonial powers to gain and govern their colonies. In 1875, Egypt sold 44% of its shares in the canal for £4 million as a result of debt to the British. The canal continued to be strategically important after the Second World War as a conduit for the shipment of oil, linking Europe with the Middle East oil fields and with Asia. In what? Britain alone, it carried 20 million tons of oil a year. In 1952, a group of young military officers called the Free Officers Movement toppled the Egyptian ruler, King Farouk forced him into exile and created an Egyptian republic. They established the Revolutionary Command Council under the leadership of Muhammad Najib. However, the real power lay with Gamal Abdul Nasser, an ambitious and visionary man who dreamed of reasserting the dignity and freedom of Arabs from the Middle East to North Africa. His first task was to tackle the continued presence of British military troops in the Suez Canal Zone, a source of bitter resentment among many Egyptians. With over 80,000 troops in the zone, Britain had the largest overseas military base in the world, a symbol of British imperial dominance where the Union Jack still flew. A huge complex of dockyards, airfields, warehouses and barracks stretched along the canal for two-thirds of its length and covered over 9,000 square miles. The Suez base was considered as an important part of Britain's strategic position in the Middle East and Africa. However, increasingly it became a source of growing tension in the Anglo-Egyptian relations. In 1954, Nasser negotiated a new treaty with the British, under which the British forces would leave within 20 months, but maintenance of the base would be continued and Britain held the right to return for seven years. Also, the Suez Canal Company was not to be handed back to the Egyptian government until the 16th of November 1968 under the terms of the treaty. To Egypt, this was a great achievement, as for the very first time since 1882, Egypt would have no British garrison on its territory. Also, for the very first time in 25 centuries, it would have complete national sovereignty. Everything was going well until Israel troops attacked Egyptian and Palestinian forces in Gaza in 1955, killing 36 Egyptian and Palestinian troops. 
Under pressure to retaliate, NASA reached out to the British and Americans to supply him with arms. When NASA refused to promise that any US arms he might buy would not be used against Israel, and also rejected American demand for a military advisory group to be sent to Egypt as part of the price of arms sales, the Americans turned him down, and so the British followed suit. Left with no option, NASA approached the Soviet Union in 1955 and purchased a vast quantity of Soviet arms via Czechoslovakia, increasing Soviet influence in North Africa and the Arab world, which angered the Americans and the British. In London and Washington, they greeted the news with shock and rage. They both condemned NASA for giving the Russians an opportunity to establish themselves in the Middle East theater an area hitherto regarded as the preserve of the Western influence. However, NASA insisted that having got rid of the British, he had no intention of allowing the Russians to gain a foothold. But suspicions of his intentions remained high, given NASA had also refused to join the Baghdad Pact, an Arab anti-Soviet alliance. Ever ambitious and determined to modernize Egypt's economy through industrialization and to turn Egypt into a regional power, Nasser embarked on a grand project to construct a new dam at Aswan that would regulate the flow of the Nile throughout the year, release a million acres for reclamation, provide a source of irrigation, and generate electricity. At three miles long, the Aswan High Dam was to be one of the largest engineering projects in the world, viewed as a cure for Egyptian problems. But there was a problem. You see, such a massive project needed funds and expertise, which NASA didn't have. Having been turned down for arms, he once again reached out to the United States and Britain for support. However, NASA's regional ambitions were increasingly threatening the British and American interests in the Middle East as well as North Africa. As a champion of Arab unity and African liberation, intent on freeing the region from foreign influence, he used Radio Cairo to broadcast messages urging Africans and Arabs to raise and kick out foreign occupants and those acting on their behalf. At the same time, a British intelligence agency, M16, reported that NASA had been a Soviet agent, aiming to overthrow Arab monarchies, fueling tensions between NASA and the then British Prime Minister, Anthony Eden. To Eden, NASA was a dictator who had to go, so they secretly hatched plans to eliminate him by any means possible. Eden made his intentions even clear on a phone call with his Minister of Foreign Affairs remarking, what is all this poppycock you have sent me about isolating and quarantining NASA? I want him destroyed. Can't you understand? I want him murdered. In June 1956, NASA fully assumed the presidency. In July, the last British soldiers pulled out of the canal zone. However, the jubilation of the British withdrawal was short-lived when that same year the Americans decided not to finance the Aswan High Dam, and so the British followed suit. The funders urged that NASA was a sellout of the Soviets and that they had no confidence in the Egyptian economy as well as regime. You see, a month earlier, NASA had officially recognized the People's Republic of China, which angered the US, having been a sponsor of the Republic of China. Denied the funds with lame excuses to NASA, this was a great insult, so he hit back. On the 26th of July, NASA found an alternative source of income in the nationalization of the Suez Canal Company. In a three-hour speech in Alexandria, he said, Today, in the name of the people, I am taking over the company. Tonight, our Egyptian canal will be run by Egyptians. Revenues that had previously gone to the canal company will be used to finance the building of the high dam. NASA promised full compensation to the shareholders, including the British government which had a 44% holding in the company, and insisted that there would be no interference with normal traffic. Caught by surprise, Britain and France resolved to teach NASA a great lesson. British Prime Minister Anthony Eden ordered his military chiefs to prepare to dispatch troops and seize the canal by force. Britain, he said, 
could not tolerate having Nasser's thumb on her windpipe. The reaction in France was similar. The French government wanted Nasser gone, blaming him for fomenting a nationalistic rebellion in Algeria where he had supplied arms to the anti-colonial movements like the FLN. At a meeting with Eden in March 1956, the French Prime Minister Guy Mollet even compared Nasser to Hitler. On the 29th of July 1956, the French cabinet decided upon military action against Egypt in alliance with Israel. At the same time, Mollet felt very much offended by what he considered to be a passive attitude of the Americans to the nationalization of the Suez Canal Company. You see, the Americans did not agree with the Anglo-French invasion of Egypt, even though they regarded Nasser as a threat. They wanted the dispute over the nationalization to be resolved by a negotiated settlement. The only justification for military action, they argued, was if traffic through the canal was stopped. But under Egyptian management, a steady flow of traffic continued, increasing an average of 40 ships a day to 45. In addition, Americans favored a system of international control of the canal, which Nasser instantly refused, arguing that international control would infringe on Egyptian sovereignty. Nevertheless, negotiations made progress. Eden's insatiable appetite for war had run out of control. When one of his ministers prepared a paper showing that the Egyptians had every right under international law to nationalize the canal, provided they properly compensated the shareholders and observed a free transit of ships through the canal for all nations. Reading through the paper, he was not impressed with its conclusions. In a meeting, he outrageously said, this is not effing good, and threw the papers across the room. Hellbent on war, the British and French hatched a conspiracy to attack Egypt, overthrow Nasser, and install a friendly regime and take over the Suez Canal. Though it sounded easy, the British and French had no excuse to launch a war against Nasser. Finding one was hard because Nasser hadn't stopped a single ship, neither had he arrested a British national or done anything to cause an invasion. This frustrated Eden enormously. Without an excuse, why not just make up one? And so, Britain, France and Israel agreed to provoke Egypt where Israel would attack Egypt apparently for no reason in the Sinai. Now, this would prompt an Egyptian retaliation. And at this point, Britain and France will come in and order both sides to withdraw their forces from the Suez Canal. After the retreat, an Anglo-French force will occupy the canal on the pretext of protecting it from destruction because of the fighting, but with the clear motive of recapturing the entire canal. The plan was put into action on the 29th of October 1956, when Israel troops landed in the Sinai Desert with 394 paratroopers, 20 miles from the canal. In less than seven days, the entire Sinai Peninsula was in the hands of Israel. Egypt responded accordingly as per the conspirators' predictions. On the pretext of trying to separate the combatants, Britain and France issued an ultimatum to Egypt to withdraw its forces west of the canal. NASA rejected the ultimatum, giving Britain and France the excuse they needed to invade. So, they launched their attack, bombing Egyptian airfields, destroying NASA's air force, landing troops at Port Said, and dropping leaflets on Cairo urging Egyptians to overthrow his government. They also broadcasted messages from Cyprus telling the Egyptian people that Nasser was the root of all their problems. To their surprise, no single Egyptian came out to support their invasion. The people stood with their leader and defended their country with everything they could, including stones and spears. Soldiers and civilians stood together to fight off the tripartite invasion. In response, Nasser promptly sank 47 ships in the canal, blocking all traffic and cutting the major route for Europe's oil supplies, bringing about a nightmare scenario that Eden's actions were supposed to prevent. However, just eight days after the invasion, with over 500 Egyptians dead, including civilians and thousands injured, the operation was halted. But why? Why did the invaders halt the operation, yet they had everything under control? Well, when Britain, Israel and France made the invasion, 
they misjudged American and Soviet reactions. The Soviet Union threatened to intervene with nuclear missiles as well as send troops to Egypt to fight for the Egyptians. Nikita Khrushchev warned that if they did not withdraw, he would nuke both Paris and London, raising the prospects of a Third World War. At this point, you might be wondering, how would it lead to a Third World War? Let me explain. If the Soviet Union joined the war with the NATO allies, that is, Britain and France, then the United States could not remain neutral because the United States had an obligation under NATO that would require them to go to war with the Soviet Union in defense of Britain and France. Likewise, if the Soviet Union attacked Israel, the Eisenhower administration would come under heavy domestic pressure to intervene. And so, from Eisenhower's point of view, it was better to end the war against Egypt rather than run the risk of escalating it into a third world war. Britain was hit by a financial crisis that came about as a result of the blockage of the canal. Britain's oil supplies had been restricted by the closure and the UN was thinking of economic sanctions against Britain. This created a hemorrhage in Britain's currency reserves and a sudden decline in Britain's gold reserves. Traders in the US and the UK dumped the sterling, which was now on the verge of collapse. As a result, the Bank of England was forced to deplete its US dollar reserves to defend that fixed value of the pound sterling against the dollar. To avert the crisis, Britain needed urgent support to a tune of a billion dollars. When the British government sought immediate assistance from the IMF, the United States blocked it. Eisenhower even ordered his Secretary of the Treasury to prepare to sell part of the US government's sterling bond holdings. To Eden's surprise, the US said unless he seized fire and withdrew, no help would be coming. Cornered, the British government caved in. Shattered by the Suez Canal crisis, politically, physically and emotionally, facing political and economic pressure, the Prime Minister Anthony Eden announced a ceasefire on the 6th of November 1956 without warning neither France nor Israel beforehand. Troops were still in Port Said on operation maneuvers when the order came in from London. Port Said had been overrun and the military assessment was that the Suez Canal could have been completely taken within 24 hours. On the 9th of January 1957, Eden resigned. In the aftermath of the crisis, it led to a change in the regional balance of power. While the Egyptian Air Force was destroyed, Nasser emerged as the only Arab leader capable of challenging the West. Far from precipitating Nasser's downfall, it propelled him to a pinnacle of prestige and influence. He was acclaimed and idolized as the architect of Western defeat and humiliation. His photograph was displayed in cafes, taxis and shops, not only in Egypt but throughout the Middle East and North Africa. He became the most successful communicator with the Arab masses in modern times, captivating audiences on radio and television, and at huge rallies using the language of the streets mocking Western politicians and denouncing imperialism and reactionaries at every opportunity. The Suez crisis also enabled Nasser to sweep away foreign influence in Egypt's commercial, academic and social life. All British and French banks and companies were nationalized a total of 15,000 enterprises. In October 1958, Nasser concluded a deal with the Soviet Union enabling the Aswan High Dam project to proceed. Lester B. Pearson, who would later become the Prime Minister of Canada, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1957 for his efforts in creating a mandate for a United Nations peacekeeping force. He is considered the father of the modern concept of peacekeeping. The concept of the UN peacekeeping was first tested out in Egypt to replace the Anglo-French evaders. The crisis also contributed to the adoption of a new national flag of Canada in 1965. When the Egyptian government objected to Canadian peacekeeping troops because of their flag, that at that time included a British ensign, the Prime Minister Pearson proposed the simple maple leaf that was eventually adopted. For Britain, the crisis marked the end of its imperial ambitions hastening the decolonization process. Many of the remaining British and French colonies in Africa gained independence over the next few years. Globally, 
the crisis formalized the dominance of the two new superpowers, the United States and Russia, and established a balance of power that remained effective until the collapse of the Berlin Wall. With the end of the crisis, Britain's dependency on the United States became eminent to this day, having a lasting impact on Anglo-American relations. <laughs>